Greetings from the south suburbs of Chicago. This is Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood, Illinois, where the lost can be found, where the dying can receive life, and where saints can be encouraged. Greetings to my fellow church family of Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood, and also greetings to all of my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. During what is truly a unique and challenging time in modern history, as all of us in various ways have been and continue to be impacted by the effects of the novel coronavirus, it is our effort at Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood to continue to carry out the Great Commission and to uphold the great commandment of our Lord and Savior, to worship him in spirit and in truth, and to do this by virtually being able to communicate with one another. And so towards that end, what I will be doing this evening and hope to do in the coming weeks as is necessary, as we all together um, endure and continue to, in faith and in love, work together through this situation. I will continue to communicate virtually and even this coming Sunday, March 22nd at 10 o'clock a.m., we will be live streaming a virtual worship service here from the sanctuary and we will be worshiping together. So whether you have your phone or your tablet or wherever you may be, as a church family, we will still worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. And so what I'm going to be doing this evening is I'm going to be teaching a lesson that I have taught most recently here at Calvary during Sunday school, which is simply an overview of the Christian faith. I'm going to be teaching using the whiteboard here, and I'm just simply going to be teaching without any prepared notes. And so all of this will be done on one take um, without practice or preparation, just simply me teaching everyone as if we were together. And I do want to take a moment just to thank all of our leaders, our diaconate, who has been working so hard in order to keep everyone together and to keep everyone calm. So we thank God for our deacons and our trustees who have been meeting, who have been planning, who have logistically been preparing for that time in which we all come again together. Because on the other end of this situation, we will all again gather together. I also want to thank our health ministry that has been very preemptive and very anticipatory. I want to thank our media ministry that has worked so hard and worked in earnest in order to prepare logistically everything that we will need so that we can continue to remain in communication. I want to thank our finance ministry and to thank all of our ministry leaders who have been working so hard and then most of all, to thank each and every member, each and every parishioner. This is indeed in recent human history, a very unique situation. But we are, as we always have been and always will be, in the hollow of God's righteous right hand. And so what we're going to do now is, as we always would, we will begin with a word of prayer, and then I will provide an, an overview of the Christian faith. Merciful God, our creator and our sustainer, it is at this time that we, as your children, come before you in humility, in this moment of calm and concern. But Lord, it is with faith in you and a full confidence in you that we know that even in the midst of this trying and difficult time, that you are sovereign. So, Lord, let us take this situation and transform it into an opportunity in which we can love more strongly, in which we can care for others with the fullness of our love, in which we can be there for one another and to materialize and realize our faith in full view of a witnessing world. Lord, we pray for those who are in hospitals right now, 
for those who may be at home, for those who may be under quarantine. We pray for our entire world, every man, woman, and child on every continent, that our leaders and that those who have been placed under the care and protection of our leaders will work together so that we will do what is best for everyone. Lord, we know that you are sovereign, and though we may not understand in this present time why things happen as they do, we trust you. And what we will do is be obedient to you, to be gentle, to be loving, to be patient and understanding. This prayer we offer in the magnificent and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May all of God's people say, Amen. So I'm going to provide an overview of the Christian faith. So anytime that I begin teaching something, I always like to start with what I call the etymology. And so the etymology of something is simply the meaning of the word. The etymology is simply knowing what a word means. And since we are going to discuss the Christian faith, I'd like to start with a simple explanation of what we mean by the word Christian. So in the Greek, Jesus is given the title Christos. Translate it in English as the Christ. Now, a little side note here, this X is the Greek letter chi. And in the ancient church, many times, an X was used as one of the initials of Christ. Whenever the church began to become prominent in the Latin world, the Latin word for assembly was mass. And mass was normally a reference to a church service. For this reason, what began to happen over the centuries is that an abbreviation for Christmas became this, which translates to Christ's service. So sometimes we've heard people say the X is removing the Christ from Christmas. In actuality, this is a tribute to the tradition of the early church and that this is not the letter X, but the Greek letter Chi, which is actually a C. So just a side note there. So the word Christos which means Christ, is translated as anointed one, capitalized, also understood as the Messiah. Hence, the understanding of the Christianos or the Christians is that they are anointed ones. also implied and understood as followers of Jesus Christ. So to be a Christian in the simplest language is to be an anointed one. Now we might wonder what we mean by anointed. The sense of being an anointed one speaks to a Hebraic tradition or a tradition that we find in the Old Testament in which um, kings or prophets or anyone who was set apart typically with the application of oil to the head, sometimes to the hands and feet, um, but it implies that one is set apart for holiness. In this sense, there's even the Greek word agios, which literally means set 
apart. And this word agios translated into English is saint, lowercase s. So to be a saint liter literally means to be set apart. The theology of being the anointed one is that the anointed one is the one who redeems and reconciles humankind to God. So in the sense that Jesus is the Christ, those who follow him then are reconciled to God through him. Those who follow Jesus after his resurrection met in Jerusalem 50 days afterwards. So it is in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles that we are told of the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. And Pentecost is understood as the day in which the Holy Spirit descended upon all who were gathered in Jerusalem. As Jesus promised that those who followed him would be clothed with power from on high. And so they were commanded to go into the city, that city being Jerusalem, to wait to be clothed with power from on high. And so what occurs on Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit descends upon 3,000, at least 3,000 people who are gathered. And as the Holy Spirit descended upon them, we're introduced to this word. So this number here, capital G, 1100, this is called a Strong's number. And it is a reference to the Strong's exhaustive concordance. And what the Strong's exhaustive concordance does, it identifies each word that is used in scripture and provides a number of details and descriptions and various definitions in terms of how that word is used. On the day of Pentecost, we find in the text in Acts chapter 2, verse 8, we find this word glossa. Specifically, with people asking, how is it that we hear each one in our own language? Because what happens on the day of Pentecost is that people who had gathered from all over the world whether they be Judeans, Samaritans, Cretans, Arabs, Parthians, Medes. When they met, they all spoke different languages. But when the Holy Spirit descended upon them, they all began speaking in one another's glossa, which means language. This is sometimes translated as the word tongue, but glossa is to clearly be understood as a language. The best example of this is to say that Let's say a brother or sister from Germany would be sitting next to a brother or sister from the kingdom of Thailand. And the brother or sister from Germany says to the brother or sister from Thailand, Sawadikap kon sabadila, which means, hello, sir, how are you? And then the brother or sister who is from Thailand then says to the brother or sister who is from Germany, guten tag, which is good day. And then a sister or brother from, say, Mexico, from Mexico, looks over to his or her French brother or sister and says, bonjour. And then they respond with, hola, como estas? And this began happening amongst all who were gathered. So the question became, how is it that we hear each one in our own language? The reason that this occurs is because in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus, in issuing the Great Commission, commands the disciples to go into all the world and to baptize, to teach, to make disciples of all nations. The word for nations there is the Greek word ethne, which means ethnicity. Jesus is actually commanding them to make disciples of all ethnicities. And the only way they could do that is to be able to speak the language of different ethnicities because language carries culture. So that is what occurs on the day of Pentecost. 
as a result of that, those who left from Jerusalem that day and then traveled throughout Judea and then throughout Samaria and then throughout the world, they eventually came to be known as the Kuriake. There is a, um, I would say, misunderstanding, a very fair misunderstanding, that the Greek word ekklesia, with the first syllable stressed, ekklesia, translates to church. This is half right. The word ecclesia quite literally translates to assembly. This was a word that was used even before Pentecost. It was used throughout the school of Athens. It was used during the time of Socrates and Plato. It was used amongst various um, philosophers, the Epicureans, Aristotle, and so forth. The reason that we confuse ecclesia as literally translating to the word church has much to do with what happened to the word kordiake as it began to travel westward. So we will see in a moment why we believe normally that the word ecclesia is the reason in which we translate the word church from ecclesia as opposed to kodiake. So this is kodiake. It comes from the word kodias, which means Lord. Kodiake essentially is a possessive of kodias, which means of the Lord or the Lords. The Lord being Kurias Iesus Ho Christas, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, examining now this word Kuriake and what happens to it. So, the church is born in Jerusalem. So, we are here, Jerusalem, and the word kuriake is being used here. But then what happens is as this word begins to travel westward, it first travels westward to Germania. So this word kodiake, which is Greek, travels westward to Germania, which later, of course, becomes Germany. And there, this word is pronounced kirka. Now, Kodiake means the Lord's or of the Lord. When the word is translated into German, Kirka, it still means the Lord's. Then this word travels westward and north. So as it travels northwestward into Scandinavia, it becomes pronounced as Kirk, 
but it still means the Lord's. Then this word begins to travel further west to a Roman province known as Britannia, which means this would have been pronounced Kirk, just as Kirk, Kirka, Kuriake, but it still meant the Lord's, which means in modern English, we now pronounce this with a CH sound as church, but based upon its Greek root that was originally used, and this can be found in the New Testament dozens of times as Kodiake. Um, in fact, Kodiake can be found well over 61 times in the New Testament, regardless of the translation that one is using. And church, as we now pronounce it, still means the Lord's. So the actual meaning of the word church is the Lord's. It does not refer to a building. It does not refer um, to any particular denomination or delineation. It simply means anyone who follows Jesus, who belongs to the Lord. The question then is, why is it that ecclesia so often is thought to mean church? And there's a good reason for that, an understandable reason. So I mentioned the word ecclesia. This is ecclesia, meaning it's Greek, two Ks stressing the first syllable. As the church began to grow, and as the Roman Empire in the fourth century eventually embraced the church, Latin had no equivalent for Kodiake um, in that Roman culture was, for the most part, um, either polytheistic or pantheistic. There was no sense of a monotheistic um, delineation and denotation for there being one Lord outside of the emperor, outside of Caesar. Caesar would have been the closest thing to being um, the Lord, as it were. The closest word in Latin that could be translated was then ecclesia, with the second syllable being stressed. Ecclesia and ecclesia had similar meanings, assembly. But ecclesia in Latin came to be identified as a translation for Kodiake. So to this day, when we refer to something as being ecclesiastical, it's still acceptable um, and still, for the most part, will always be used as a reference for something that is um, based in the church. Um, in other words, to be ecclesial. Something that is ecclesial um, involves the church. But just for the sake of understanding what the word church actually means, it is still rooted in the word kurios in the form of kuriake. So when we speak of the church, it is important to know that if we're part of the church, it is not a matter of the square footage or the building. While denominations are very important, um, these are not designed to be barriers from the reality that we belong to the Lord. And Christianity is not a religion as much as it is a reality based upon the person in Jesus Christ. God in the person of Jesus Christ is the reality in which we center our lives. So now that we know what the word church means, um, a fair question to ask is how did our churches end up the way that they are now? And so in the first century, the church is best thought of as a renegade group. In terms of a basic timeline, and I'm really crunching um, a lot of things together here, but 7 BCE, which means before the Common Era, also understood as BC, either one is correct, this is thought to be the year in which Jesus of Nazareth is born and crucified in the year 26 AD, making him 33 years of age. It is thought at this point that Rabbi Shaul, or Paul, begins writing his first letters, having been um, converted, as it were, or at least called and commissioned as an apostle. Of course, Paul, um, prior to this, was actually one of the um, individuals responsible for persecuting the early church. 
so during this time, what we have is the growth and the proliferation of the early church, the early Kodiake. It is not until the year 70 CE that we see the first of what are testaments of faith, later known as the Gospels. We have the Gospel of Mark. By the year 85, we then also have Matthew. And we also have Luke, Acts, which is one book. Roughly between 90 and 95, we finally have the Johannine tradition or the Gospel of John. These four Gospels would be understood to be um, authentic by St. Augustine, um, who we get to in just a moment here. But this is what's happening in the first century. The church is a renegade group. Um, a very important incident happens here in the year 70. You have the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which brings about a dispersion of Christians and Jewish adherents throughout the ancient Near East. The church begins to grow and become more structured in the second century with there being titles such as Episcopos, which means bishop. Presbyteros, which means elder. Poimen, pastors. Diakonos, deacons. So the second century is a time of structure for the church. So first century, they're renegades. Second century, structure. And this continues into the third century as well. as a time of structure. Something prolific happens in the fourth century, considered one of the most important events in the world, and really sets the stage for where we are now. And that is called the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And this occurs in the year 312 AD or CE. In a word, what happens in this battle is you have two Roman generals. On one side, Maxentius Dia. On the other side, you have Constantine. They are both on opposite sides of the Milvian Bridge. Maxentius Dia had what is recorded as being as many, in some cases, as 20,000 troops. Constantine has said, in some reports at least, some reports vary, but to have as few as 2,000 troops, as the story is often recorded. Neither of these Roman generals um, were Christians. And as we understand the story, that on the evening of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, Constantine had a dream. And in his dream, he saw emblazoned in fire the initials of Christ. This would be Chi Rho, C-R. Constantine records and um, recalls as well, hearing the voice of Christ say to him, conquer by this. So Constantine orders that his men who had shields, on their shields would paint the initials of Christ. And this was known as the labarum. So the labarum was painted on each shield of every man fighting for Constantine. Over the course of that battle, what happened is as Maxentius Dia was charging, famously, the bridge gave way. In many ways decimating the forces of Maxentius Dia. And Constantine who was greatly outnumbered in the battle, becomes the victor. And from that point, we enter into state-endorsed Christianity. Now, 
what Constantine forms is lowercase c, he starts what is called Catholicity or a universal church. And in doing so, he appoints a commission made up of Athanasius, Augustine, Arius, and they are all assigned the duty of determining what books would appear in the New Testament in what order, and Augustine most famously canonizes the Bible. He canonizes the New Testament. That is, he decides which books will appear in it, in what form, and in what order. So the fourth century really sets the stage for the beginning of the modernizing of Christianity. It would undergo a number of changes, particularly in the sixth century with Charles the Great, and the rise of the Christian Crusades, which now as we examine the Crusades um, from a historical perspective, um, became a time in which unfortunately the church in many ways became the source of persecution of which it once was being persecuted. So in a sense, um, what I've done is taken about 500 years and tried to turn it into about 35 minutes worth of overview. But Whenever we talk about the church and we talk about the Christian faith, I wanted to provide sort of an umbrella in this first lesson of, of where we begin. So as an ending point, I often say that whenever teaching something, I may provide a lot of details and provide a lot of nuance, but when it's all said and done, I really just want to convey in simple terms, what does it all mean? All of this was happening in these first five centuries of the church's growth because the gospel was going forth. The good news was going forth. Now, it was being heard and interpreted in various ways, as it is today. But the simple truth of the saving power of Jesus Christ is what was going forth. So early in my career, I've now been in ministry almost 18 years. Um, I've now been preaching almost 17, been pastoring almost 11. But very early in my career, um, I had the blessing of teaching middle school students. And when I was teaching um, a particular student, a student was asking me, at this time I was Mr. Grimes, before I was Reverend Grimes and later Pastor Grimes. He said to me, Mr. Grimes, how do you become a Christian? So I recalled at that time um, that I had to wrestle with um, the, the ethical duality of being a public school um, instructor. At the same time, I did not want to give up this opportunity to share the gospel. So I had to find a creative way to convey this. And I've often believed that the same truth that allows a seven-year-old to say amen is the same truth that allows a 70-year-old to say amen. And that at the end of the day, if you don't remember anything else that I've gone over, the dates, the terms, at the end of the day, what is most important is do we understand the reality of the love of Jesus Christ? So this is normally how I explain salvation if someone were to ask me. Imagine we have a house. In fact, let's make it a mansion. And I always like to have a little shrubbery um, with, with, with my houses. So this is in honor of Bob Ross. We're just going to put some happy little bushes here and a few happy little trees. And so that way we, we have some landscaping here. And then we'll add a few more windows on the side here. So we have this house. And inside of this house, um, a father lives there, and he has lots of children who live in this house with him. And he decides that he wants the children to have some space of their own, but he wants them close. So what he does is he builds for them a nice little neighborhood 
right next to the house. So they're close, but at the same time, he just wanted to give to them a nice little space that they can have. And they all have a way to get home. And they have a walkway and they have their own little area here. And so things are fine because there's a face-to-face relationship between this father and his children. But then over time, some of the siblings start talking and they decide they want their own place. So they move out a little further and they decide to build their own house. And now they're distanced from their father. So they talk with their father, but not like they used to. And over time, they move further away and even further away. And as they move further away, even the way they build the houses starts to change. It almost gets to a point that some of the houses don't even look like houses anymore. And pretty soon, even the children who were close, well, they stop maintaining what they have and it starts to sort of depreciate and deteriorate. And then what happens is pretty soon you have houses that are all over the place and then let's say you even have um, some, some smoldering fires, you have some smoke, you have flames, you have different things that are happening. And before you know it, there's just confusion everywhere. So the father seeing all of this happening, he decides he's going to try to maintain a connection. So he sets up a phone line system and, and tries to stay in contact with his children, no matter where they are. But what happens is there's always something interfering with the phone line and cutting the phone line off or there's static and there's bad communication. And meanwhile, you still have other poorly constructed homes being built all over the place and there's still smoldering fires everywhere and there's just confusion and chaos. But the father keeps trying to reach out and connect. And every time something happens and the line is cut. And so pretty soon it's just chaos everywhere. And it's just a complete um, destruction and deconstruction of what was intended. As this keeps happening, inside of the house, there is one child who remained and who says, Dad, I can fix this. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a way that right in the middle of all of the chaos, that no matter where the children have gone, I'm going to shine so brightly that no matter where they are, they don't have to get connected all the way back to the house. All they have to do is find me wherever they are. If they can just find me, and then I'm going to light the path and lead them back to you. And whenever they get back to you, then we can make right everything that went wrong. And not only that, we're still going to give them now on the inside of this house, we're going to make mini mansions. So that way they will still have something, but they will always be reconciled and be close. And all it takes is for them to have to admit that they can't make it out here by themselves and that they need you. And I'm going to make it as easy as possible for them to find me and I'll lead them back to you. This act of admitting that we as human beings can't make it on our own, we call this confession. It is an admission that we are human and we can't make it on our own. And that it took the anointed one. It took the Messiah to do what we could not do, which by showing the ultimate act of love and taking upon himself everything that went wrong, though being blameless himself, taking everything that went wrong upon himself, taking all the blame, taking all the sin, taking all of the disobedience upon himself, in order to reconcile us to the Father. And once we admit that we can't make it without God, and once we head home, we call that salvation. 
In other words, we have been saved from what we ought not to be so that we can be reconciled as we should be. That is what happened whenever our Lord and Savior gave himself for us. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended upon all who were gathered in Jerusalem, it was a moment in which the living and saving power of God became evident through those of us who believe in him and who live according to the way in which he has commanded us to live. That is to love one another. That is to be patient, to be kind, to be gentle. And so it's not a matter of the size of the building or even having a building. We are the church because we serve the Lord. We are the Lord's. And that is what makes us the church. And that is an overview of the Christian faith. If I got overly detailed, the great thing is this is on YouTube, so you can always just run back to the minute or second point in which you want to rewatch something. And I just want to thank you and again to thank all of our leaders for allowing me as pastor of this great church to have this opportunity with you just to teach a little bit and just to remain connected with you. As we prepare now for our closing prayer, I again just want to encourage everyone that no matter where you are, that no matter what you are experiencing right now, I want you to know and I need you to know that you will make it through this. It will be difficult, yes. At times frightening, yes. But there will come a day, and not even that far from now, there will come a day, not even that far off in the future, where we will look back on this time and we will rejoice because we will know that whenever we felt unsure for a moment or doubtful in terms of just how things were going to go, that the entire time that we knew that God was caring for us and God is caring for us. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be hopeful. I want you to smile. I want you to take this time to reflect and even just spend time calling people that normally you may not have an opportunity to call or just to spend time with family. This is the season of Lent after all. And so we are in that reflective time of the year in which we can even take this moment to rest in the storm, to use the words of Dr. Kirk Byron Jones, to just rest in the midst of even the most turbulent times because God is covering us and we're going to be more than fine when this is all said and done. So continue to be encouraged, continue to be strengthened in the Lord. Merciful God, we thank you for this time of learning. We thank you for this time of teaching. Lord God, I pray that wherever your children are, that wherever we are in the midst of this time, that we will never forget that your light still shines and that your light shines within us. So Lord, I pray now that for every family who is worried and concerned, for every sister and brother who is on their sick bed, for every healthcare worker, for every dedicated civil servant, for every parent, for every child, for each and every one of all eight billion of your children upon this earth. Lord, that we would remember that you will never forsake us and that your promises are true, that you will be with us, that you are with us, and that you are with us always. So let us take this day in which you have instructed us to remember that this day is our daily bread. Let us take this day, our daily bread, and rejoice in this day and to rejoice in this moment. And let us be thankful even when times are difficult. For God, we know that times will not remain difficult and we know that Times will not remain stressful, but give us strength and endurance in the midst of this. And let us remember that your word says that we are not of those who shrink back and so are lost. But we are of those who endure and so are saved. So, Lord, we pray that you will strengthen us, that we may endure and that we may move forward with courage, with hope and with happiness, with joy and a sense of victory, for victory is at hand even when times are difficult. We thank you 
that you are our champion. We thank you that you are our victor. We thank you that you are our provider. We thank you that you are our sustainer. We thank you that you are our healer. In this prayer, we lift to you in the mighty and precious name, in the glorious, wonderful, and magnificent name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we all say amen. May God bless you.